and uh, I want to say hello to all good friends that are following us at the moment uh, in uh, Facebook and in YouTube. Uh, and um, to open up officially the 14th edition of She Leader in a Shell. And uh, today our topic is the important and my special guest is Biliana Frey, uh, who is co-founder and CEO of uh, Orbit. Uh, more importantly, Biliana, who is living in New York, uh, is Bulgarian, and we always uh, are happy to have in this leadership format uh, Bulgarian female leaders. Uh, so I'm looking forward uh, to, to have a very good discussion on uh, how we bridge uh, the ocean uh, with Bulgarian flavor. But maybe to um, before giving a word uh, to Biljana to introduce her, uh, she's co-founder and CEO of Orbit. And if you don't know Orbit, this is B2B networking platform uh, that is helping communities and community managers uh, to create uh, exponential value for their members through curated one-to-one -one connections. And Orbit works uh, with leading startups, VCs, professional communities. Uh, they help uh, scaling peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing uh, through recurrent curated and guided one-to-one -one conversation. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, background uh, for Biliana. Uh, she graduated from London School of Economics. She has been living in London for quite some time, but not only, also in uh, Hong Kong, in New York, and was doing uh, different things in her career from investigative uh, organized crime in Bulgaria to international finance uh, uh, internationally. So, uh, Biliana has been featured in Forbes, in Business Insiders, in Thrive, in Crunchbase. She's a NASDAQ uh, milestone maker. I can speak a lot about uh, uh, her publicity, but uh, uh, I'm sure uh, you are curious uh, what is the connection uh, for uh, to, to our She Leader format. Uh, in addition to doing uh, and managing uh, important business. Uh, uh, she also is a winner of the Uber Girl Boss competition for disruptive businesses uh, in the US. So as I said, uh, Biliana is living uh, in New York um, and in addition to her professional activities, she is passionate about uh, wildlife conservation, uh, she supports educational initiatives like Pencils of Promise. Uh, she also supports next generation female leaders uh, through communities, of course, uh, like Dreamers uh, and uh, Chief. So, Biliana, I, uh, I'm sure there is uh, much more uh, to say about you, but I was uh, thinking uh, this morning on this special day, 11th, 11th, uh, I read that this is uh, a day where a special portal is open for people uh, to reach out higher dimensions. And I said, eventually, it's not a coincidence that uh, we have today as a guest someone uh, who built and manages a portal uh, for meeting uh, people uh, and communities uh, within our dimension. So tell us uh, more about uh, Orbit and uh, what exactly um, your platform is doing. Well, first of all, Sasha, thank you so much for uh, having me today and for this extremely generous introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and also a, a real honor to be interviewed by such an established she leader as, as yourself. So I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, so yeah, a little bit about Orbit and I guess um, what led us to this point in time. I have to say everything that I've done has always been driven by people, all the best lessons. Um, I've always learned best from people and been inspired. Even in my career in finance, um, well, peer learning has just been such a powerful way to um, kind of advance and, and get the hang of something really quickly versus 
the internet and all the one di one directional resources that we tend to get from our organizations and all the content that we're bombarded with i do think that the most powerful way to learn is from other operators and other peers that are facing similar challenges so um it's kind of been a common thread in my community uh even when i had technical roles in finance to think about okay well now that we've done those now that we've structured those pension funds and and trusts who can i introduce that will really help each other either advance their careers internally or refer a deal to one another it's kind of been a real passion of mine so i first started connecting people within the royal bank of scotland in london uh, I worked for the wealth management division over there, and I noticed we we're bleeding clients to competitors because uh, this, sometimes we, we didn't have the right products for them in this particular part of the bank. And even if we had them elsewhere, people just like wouldn't reach out uh, because they didn't have the right point of contact. So I'm like, no, okay, if you, you guys shadow each other, build the trust, understand each other's products. So yeah, experiential learning and, and peer connectivity has, um, I, I saw the powers of that firsthand already 10 years ago within the context of a, of, of, of a humongous bank. And then I thought, I thought maybe it's just the financial industry and, and finance people. But then when I made the career switch to tech, I was like, oh, tech people work in a bubble too. And there's so much like tribal knowledge that's, that's lost within a company, let alone across industries. So ultimately, um, uh, when I when I met my co-founder, we really bonded over this idea that the internet originally really connected us, but then disconnected us. We were all clicking and liking and consuming this content, but not really having meaningful conversations with with the right people. So we took on this challenge already back in uh, in 2018. To, 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 to create meaningful, meaningful connections, to really enhance human potential through introducing you and, have, and, and, and making seamless conversations with the right people that can really advance you personally or professionally. And we started doing that first through a job shadowing platform. It was all focused on in-person experience, but we always also knew that we have to introduce a digital component. So once we figured out a really powerful way and fine tune the algorithm, our AI algorithm to, to introduce our the right members to one another within our own community. Then we had this light bulb moment of the world is made up of communities. Um, and we could be the company that powers each and one of them and really help you as member, help community managers reach efficiency and consistency and scale in bringing the right people together and help members really extract maximum value for which whatever group they're in. So last year in October 2020, God, the pandemic timing is uh, it's, it's all blurred the last couple of years. But yeah, last October we relaunched as Orbit.ai and we're essentially a matchmaking engine helping any type of community um, introduce its members for one-to-one -one conversations at scale on a continuous basis. So can you elaborate a little bit more about this algorithm? Because there are many matchmaking uh, platforms on the market, but uh, yours seems to be very special knowing how you grow business-wise because we have a little bit of uh, a chat around yeah. this, but uh, for our audience now, we will be interested to understand what is so special about Orbit. For sure. Well, you know, we started our own community that anchored in in-person connections because we were a little bit snobbish about virtual connections because every time as a, a community member of existing groups, I tried existing tools. Um, I always found them to be either really hard work and I have to create yet another profile and update yet another picture and share another bio or uh, I would somehow be introduced to a really random person. And even if it's a really high quality community, when you're just thrown with no context, uh, with someone that you're fumbling in the dark, why were you even introduced? What do you have in common? It's actually more frustrating than, than value add. So for a long time, I didn't even think of, of designing a virtual product. I, I really wanted everything to be kind of in, in person and we had a completely different flow. But when we did face the challenge and looked at the market, actually there's a, yeah, there was quite a few of engagement community tools out there and matchmaking services. You would be surprised how many of them are actually based on random interactions and mostly based on availability. Oh, we're part of this group. We can speak at 3 p.m. on a Friday. Great. 
uh, and it throws us on an invite. But then we have only 20 minutes to figure out what, yeah, what do we have in common? How, do, how can we help each other? Whereas with Orbit and as former community managers, we really have this thesis that one bad connection is too many and time is our most precious resource. So we really over obsess on the curation and making sure that when we introduce two people together, we know for a fact they're with similar professional backgrounds, similar company stages, they're interested in, in discussing similar topics. The, the scheduling is super frictionless. So we introduce you, we send you a calendar invite, and uh, we also provide you with icebreakers and a conversation guide. So even if the chat is only 30 minutes from the first minute, you can dive right in and extract a lot of value, dive straight into, into, into deep conversations rather than fumbling in, in kind of surface level intro chat. We're very, very big on 30 minutes, make it count. We know, we know you two have a ton in common. So here is the, here is the plan. Because everyone is, everyone is so busy. I know people don't have the time to research one another and really prepare. Um, but if you've opted in for that connection, you are seeking something. So presented with a very frictionless experience with the right curation, um, you, you, these conversations could really be life changing. And we're seeing that across number of communities that we work with. So, for example, we um, we work with Modern Fertility, which is a which is a leader in um, kind of fertility tests here in the UK, and we connect their entire customer base. We match their, um, their, their, their customers on custom criteria, like how long have you been trying to get pregnant for, by what donor, what age group are you at? And we're connecting women that have no outlet to speak about the difficulties that they're facing and carry this like burden and challenge within them. And for the first time, we're actually plugging them into the community and connecting them with someone that's literally same age group has been facing the same struggles for the same period of time um, and that is incredibly powerful just to know you're not alone to receive that emotional support and to have that kind of we call the fertility buddy for example to 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 support you on the journey this is an example of more of a powerful kind of emotional uh connection where it's more of a support match but we have very powerful experiences where we connect in, in a professional context founders of the same stage company that are raising the same funding round that are facing the same challenges with the funding round and you connect and it's again such a powerful outlet but at the same time you introduce your investors to one another you exchange contacts like the right conversations can be can be life-changing in a personal and, and a professional setting so we really yeah in a in, in a nutshell over over obsessed with the with the curation and making every minute count. Sounds like uh, you can find uh, your uh, twin flame uh, through Orbit platform. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, already people that are following our conversation uh, now uh, are very interested to connect, to understand more. So I want to encourage everybody to uh, send your question in a chat, uh, uh, the theme that uh, works together with us uh, invisibly for you will help uh, we to address them in the conversation uh, with uh, my special guest today. Uh, so uh, we speak uh, and uh, you've mentioned quite some time tribes, communities, and uh, I personally believe that uh, the importance of communities becomes larger and larger. I'm a person that uh, really believes that communities are that drives uh, the progress ahead rather than uh, institutionalized uh, structures on many levels, business-wise, political-wise, uh, social-wise, any dimension. But uh, this is also a challenge because every one of us uh, uh, belongs to different type of communities in different contexts uh, of life. So uh, do you um, uh, experience uh, uh, the usage of Orbit uh, for different purposes by same people? And uh, do you have technology that will help uh, 
professional woman to uh, meet investors, but same woman to uh, eventually identify a community of interest, being this uh, uh, related to pregnancies, uh, challenges, or just friends that uh, uh, support uh, wildlife uh, uh, like yourself? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question, and uh, I totally share your your belief and, and 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 passion that communities are the driving force of the world. That that that's what makes us inherently human. And uh, for anyone that hasn't read *Sapiens* by Professor Yuval Harari, uh, which is which describes the history of mankind, that's one of the most fascinating books that really describes how yeah com communities is what makes us human and what has driven progress so far and what's going to. I think um, continue to even accelerate our progress going forward. So, uh, great question about how do you kind of source? How, how do you have different communities that answer different needs? And to that, I'll tag along the question: Can you overdose on communities? And I think the the question is: I think the question is yes. I think we're going through a phase where there's so many new communities created and and popping up, and if they if they answer a very, if, if they're related to very specific interest or group um, that that you that that you feel as value, great, join them. But I think on the other hand, you have to think about we have finite amount of time, so um, sorry, we don't have. Uh, yeah, we have finite amount of time, so we have to be more selective because the more communities you join. In a sense, the less time you have to be engaged with them, and I really advocate for maybe a handful of communities that answer your needs and correspond to your identities, but going deeper into them rather than staying surface level on a, in a number of groups. So actually, before um, before becoming a mom uh, in July last year, I really looked at all the groups that I'm part of and. Uh, with that, all the money that I'm spending on memberships and the time that I'm committing and did a little bit of a community cleanse. So now I'm a member probably of, of seven communities that I do actually commit to going deeper and about five of them use Orbit. So I am that woman that has the different needs of talking about, you know, mom related issues and founder issues and building a soft, specifically building software uh, business and wildlife conservation. And um, I feel very empowered when I get different different invitations for introductions from all of these communities. It's a little bit of what state of mind am I in? What what who do I need to speak on this particular week? Very much like Netflix. What do I want to watch? If I get all these invitations and, and recommendations, I'm like, okay, actually this week I have a very like I, I'm really in the mindset of planning for my Series A fundraise, and I'd love to speak to another SaaS founder, so I opt into that. Um, if I have a more relaxed end of the week, that my chats typically happen on a Friday. I, I can I can I can take a, a surprise call as well on something that might not be top of mind. Or sometimes I feel like I'm dealing with very specific female founder challenges, balancing family and business, and then I tend to then opt into a community to speak to another female founder. So uh, I, I I think I think there's definitely and there's a need. It's something that we're thinking about as a product to be able to really productize all these invites and and schedule them and control them even more. That's that's on the roadmap. But for the time being, I think it's a privilege to have the opportunity to to build these deep connections. And it's it, and then it's up to us to prioritize which which community um, based on interest or challenges that we're facing do we want to lean in more. And I hope really more people get in that position fast where they are offered these connections from the multiple communities that they are part of so they can be receiving this regular support. I don't go a week without meeting without meaning without meeting um, someone that can help me or can relate to something that I'm going through. I get this like dose of support through these memberships and through these conversations on a weekly basis. And it's, it's just invaluable to end the week and offload with someone that completely relates to you and is able to help as well. Uh, you are using AI and, um, at that moment, I want to remind that artificial intelligence is nothing different than extension of our human intelligence. And uh, we should be, of course, uh, um, uh, feel good about this, that we have instruments that can help us to grow in our personal intelligence. 
but uh, AI steps on data and uh, processing data big time. Uh, so the question is um, uh, for me, uh, to which extent um, uh, you are profiling your, um, let's say, members uh, of the platform? Uh, is this going uh, on a group level or individual level, on cross community uh, level, just to uh, secure the proper service of people on a AI push uh, uh, basis? Great question. So we took a very specific approach to how uh, in, it kind of invasive are we going to be, and we took a step. We took a stance actually that we want to be very, very respectful of community members' data and only use what they volunteer to share. So the way it works is, if you wanted, for example, to match make the she leader community, you will create as a community as a community manager uh, your your kind of admin profile in Orbit. So Orbit is just for the community managers. Everything else, the whole experience for the members is via the email, very, very frictionless. But in that profile, you will drop the logo, you will select some of the discussion topics because you know best what your community is interested in talking about. You will select some uh, specific matching criteria. We'll make recommendations for you. For example, ask for their professional experience in LinkedIn, uh, stage company, things along those lines. And then we reach out to them on your behalf asking, hey, if you would like to be matched with someone, please give us those data points. And it takes 20 seconds for the member to share yeah, their experience, company stage, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the only data that we use to then make the introduction. So we will focus, we'll, we'll take those, um, we'll also grab their availability. We, we, we don't even integrate with their calendars. We work with typically very senior professional audiences and we, we have heard and we think people are very protective of their contacts and getting allergic to startups that prioritize aggressive growth versus respect of privacy. So we ask you to share your, 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 your availability manually rather than um, integrate with your calendar. We make that as easy as possible, but it's a slightly longer, slightly longer step, which uh, most people still appreciate that it doesn't integrate with their calendar. And then once we have the people that voluntarily said, yes, I want to be matched with another sheet leader next week, um, our algorithm will take all that data, um, come up with the best matches and send email introductions. Hey, Viliana, hey, Sasha, you should talk, although I'll never be matched with you. You're far too experienced. You're a much more senior leader than me. Um, so we will we'll make the introductions by email. We'll send you a calendar invite. And um, yeah, we don't scrape the internet. We don't get it. We don't collect anything additional. Uh, and we've had investors that have pushed us in that direction so far. We've uh, we've been holding our ground. The thing is that uh, the thing is that users at the same time are protective of data, but they are spoiled with very with very seamless personalized experiences in other platforms that are more aggressive. So we're spoiled by the level of personalization that we get from certain services, but at the same time, don't want to disclose our data. So we have we're a little bit maybe at a tipping point ourselves as a company. Uh, to think about how do we marry those super high expectations of um, event users for, you know, miraculously personalized matches, also on the basis of you live in the same neighborhood, you drink the same flavor coffee, uh, but at the same time, not take too much time to ask people to volunteer that information and without scraping third party sources. It's a, it's a continuous, um, it's, 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 it's as a company, you have to continuously make that choice. And so far, we've continuously made the choice to be more on the super respectful and super conservative side on, on usage of data. Um, we are also expanding into more enterprise clients. We're about to start. Uh, we did a super successful pilot with Silicon Valley Bank connecting their early stage clients. So early stage founders that bank with Silicon Valley Bank uh, typically used to be invited, aside from the benefits of the financial services, would uh, also be invited to a lot of um, happy hours or webinars to talk about the challenges of fundraising and um, so on and so forth, various other non 
uh, support beyond the products and services. So we came in and we said, we can accelerate that support. We can match them to one another. Pilot went great and now we're starting to work with them. But you can just imagine what the security, data privacy and security requirements of a financial, of an enterprise regulated financial institution in the States look like. We've been in vendor approval process with them for six months and um, still haven't seen the end of it. And they do appreciate that conservative approach and that super respectful approach to, to their clients' data. So yeah, that's that's the corner that we're in, um, using AI in a very controlled way. And yeah, we have other we have it's it, it's it's hard to be making that choice over and over again. We also had an investor in the fundraising process suggest, oh, um, you know, there's a lot going on now in the crypto world, and a lot of people are using avatars. Maybe you should maybe instead of introducing people with their real identities, you could just be introducing their avatars and. Maybe they can just text rather than talk. And I was like, I think we're trying to do something completely different here. We're really trying to show people what it's like to be human, what it's like to actually connect. And if the next generation feels uncomfortable to present themselves in a screen to screen or face to face chat, I personally feel obliged to kind of really encourage them and nudge them to do that and, and, and save them from this like underground crypto world with, with avatars. Um, so yeah, there's um, you have you have to fight your stance, and as a as a founder, you have to I think really stick to your beliefs and your and your mission. Listen to the listen to the customers, but also stick to your guns and have a conviction because there's a lot of opinions and a lot of options that that exist out there for how to run your business, how to use data. Um, yeah, to avatar or not to avatar. And right now we're in the not to avatar <laughs> corner. Uh, I'm of uh, this generation, uh, although all of my life I've been uh, spent in the digital industry and knowing the advanced technologies. Uh, uh, I love the way when a friend is calling me and says, how are you doing? And can I introduce uh, X, Y, Z uh, uh, to you? Because uh, eventually you can uh, meet uh, your interests. Of course, uh, uh, this is a very linear process and I appreciate very much that uh, you made it through artificial intelligence, through uh, really finding a way to uh, exponentially grow the opportunities because that's the era we are living in. Uh, but uh, speaking on this line, uh, maybe it's useful to share where you want to go. Uh, what is the end, uh, end goal that you envisage today uh, in orbit? Because as you said earlier, uh, you are in fact a very, very young company. You are three, four years uh, old, uh, although very successful on the market. So what is the end goal looking the horizon from today's perspective? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, we're really on a mission to redefine how people think about community engagement. And we still find that so much of the thought process right now, if we have any, 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 any she leaders that are listening right now and uh, thinking about starting a community, I'm sure a lot of it is, well, what should I name it? How are we going to brand it? How often are we going to be sending them a newsletter? Should we have an annual conference? Should they should they be should we create a should we create a dedicated Slack channel or maybe there is one that exists already? Um, and I really want to redefine that process to all of this is nice to have. I'm not anti newsletter; it serves a purpose. But sending a newsletter, or organizing a one off annual conference, does not form a community. What forms a community is that is 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 that union of purpose, that commonality of purpose and frequency of touch. So really, the, really find community engagement as I'm bringing this group of people together and how can I best create the best environment for them to continuously get value from one another, to connect with one another, member to member, more so than community to member. Um, and also to take, be, be humble enough to take that step back, create the environment, use the tools that can that can create that and watch the magic unfold versus kind of a very controlled, moderated, one directional communication, which still, unfortunately, I find to be the way. I mean, it presents a great opportunity for us. Um, a lot of people ask me, oh, what's one thing that surprised you about the product? Um, 
something that you've learned. And actually, the biggest thing that surprises me is when even really, really experienced community managers and community leaders say, oh, you know, we really didn't expect this to be so successful and for people to love these connections so much. And it always kind of blows my mind because um, it's just so obvious to me that the world is made up of communities and we're surrounded by people that we, we should be talking to, that we could be so helpful to one another. And it's still, as you said, and I also love it when a friend calls me too, hey, do you want this introduction? It's still so manual and, um, and the ones that from a community, the ones that shout the loudest and constantly ask for for these introductions are the ones that get them. But it's not evenly distributed. Um, it doesn't happen often enough. And communities that don't use tools like Orbit typically have, yeah, have I, I, I think run very like underutilized groups and and uh, and really are not maximizing the potential of of their members, not maximizing the value. So where we're going. Um, we first launched and kind of became a leader in the space of connecting venture capital firms. We work with, you know, the, the majority of the leading fund, VC funds in Silicon Valley, in New York, in London, um, a few leading funds in, in Europe and Berlin as well. And we connect kind of the most cutting edge operators. So anyone from Airbnb and um, even more mature companies like Apple, Donut, um, Trello, yeah, leading leading start startups across the board, people that are inventing the future. So now we're trying to connect their customers and really expanding into an entirely new use space and changing the narrative of how companies communicate with their customers. Very much like leaning into um, rather than re redefining what marketing success is and what building a, a successful relationship with your customers is again not necessarily just top down from the company newsletters and and i think as consumers we're also a little bit we're waking up to the fact that every company is trying to claim you as a as a member of their community but what does that really mean if you're just using the product and receiving a newsletter does that make you part of their community and and we think not uh, versus a case like modern fertility where genuinely you use the product, it's, 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 it's life changing. You're also being connected into a group of women with similar circumstances. You're empowered to have those conversations. You find a support network and you build a much deeper and more authentic relationship with the company. You become an evangelist. You are likely to use that product for you and advocate for it for much longer. You're likely to tolerate probably a price increase. So it's a, it's a win-win situation where customers consumers of this of products and services can um, get much bigger value by connecting and plugging into other customers that are just as passionate about that product and service and on and for the company you can create really achieve very powerful business outcomes by having an engaged customer community so that's the next step for us um, uh, building out that vertical we work with another another example is a fintech company based in France called Spendesk. They run a community of 5,000 CFOs across various European countries. They used to try to manually run spreadsheets of who should talk to who and manually run introductions. So when they found us, they were like, oh my God, it's the first time we find a company that does exactly what we wanted to do. We took that spreadsheet, we introduced our flow, we 6 x the the impact in terms of number of people actually opting in with amazing results. And we continuously uh, introduce that professional network of CFOs and continuously getting amazing testimonials. Like it's so helpful to speak to a CFO at, a, at this similar stage company and talk about the tools and the strategies that they use. How do you communicate with management? Just share, share challenges that can feel so isolating when you're the only CFO um, of, of a company, for example. And then in the long run, I mean, there's more established uh, industries and organizations and huge communities that we think this could add a ton of value to. Um, we just think about kind of global um, healthcare organizations around, you know, cancer research or kidney.org. My dad actually had a kidney transplantation and he was on dialysis for 10 years before that. And I know that even more so than the support that Kind of the opinions and support that he received from doctors. He was continuously learning and exchanging best practices and tips how to like cope with this lifestyle. Um, 
and, and, and health issue with other people that are in the same in the same boat, but they, it was literally the people in the same room. And I, and I'm very personally motivated to when I think of him, I did, did he really speak to the best people over the course of those 10 years? And I see a couple of like amazing friendships that he formed by brothers of destiny, literally in the same room. But yeah, imagine being able to plug him into a global community and really introduce him to someone that's uh, maybe also has the same professional background and kind of the same family set up and this exactly the same health problem. And you can then the camaraderie that you can build and the support that, that these relationships can give you are just so, so powerful. So very excited for us to double down on that on kind of larger also in the long run healthcare organizations and, um, and provide meaningful support versus just, um, again, a lot of, a lot of, um, isolation and fear alleviate a lot of the isolation and fear that uh, people like that are, are facing. Uh, you've mentioned your son and um, I just want to bring you to a little bit uh, more private uh, part of your life because uh, I know that uh, you are mother of two and uh, you are also CEO of a growing uh, company and uh, that's the situation that uh, many of uh, our female entrepreneurs uh, uh, are in, especially being uh, in your age, in younger age. Uh, so uh, we can speak uh, a lot about biases, about ability uh, to combine both uh, um, mothers and, of course, professional responsibilities, but uh, what is your experience? What you would uh, share and what advice possibly uh, you would give to our uh, to our um, friends that are listening to us? Oh, advice. I, I don't like giving unsolicited advice, but um, uh, what I would say is, well, I, I, I do think we're stronger than we think. Now that I'm a, a, a working mother, in absolute awe and went through motherhood myself for the first time. So I have one 16, 16 month old daughter, Jackie, and a son in the making arriving in the end of February. And uh, yeah, it's incredibly on the one hand fulfilling to be growing a business and growing a family, but I'm not gonna lie, it's also uh, very, very challenging. And some days the, the bar is, okay, everyone survived, good. <laughs> We're going to bed and, no, no fires are burning. Everyone is, everyone is fine. So, um, yeah, motherhood has taught me a lot about sometimes. I mean, I, 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 am still a perfectionist, but sometimes I was just like, so really wanting to control everything and, uh, control the, the, the outcome and having extremely like sometimes unrealistic high standards for everything. And I'm like, okay, progress is good. Putting one foot in front of the other. Um, and I, I, I still am a big proponent that yes, we could, we could have it all, but with a very clear understanding that you might not have it all in one day. So if you have a day where you're really, really leaning into work, um, it's inevitable that something has to give and maybe, yeah, you won't, you won't have to be able to prioritize family and, and vice versa. Um, and also that it, it inevitably comes with sacrifices. So when you think about what you really, really want, try to think about, well, what are you going to give it? What are you going to have to give up uh, to achieve that? So for me, actually, the pandemic was a big blessing. I know some people struggle. This was a very individual experience, but for me, becoming a mom during the pandemic and focusing just on work and family with like all social life um, and traveling, kind of going out of the window and having no fear of missing out, that was that was positive. I'm 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 struggling now because in New York things are getting back to normal and there's a lot more temptation and now I have to be making very clear sacrifices and choices of okay, well it's still I have to continue in this more hermit mode of 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 family and work and yeah, maybe fun and social life is deprioritized for the time being, but I very much see the next few years as a period of building, building, building. Um so I've I've learned a long time ago to enjoy the grind and enjoy the journey rather than be tied to outcomes, for example, especially on the business front, because 
building a startup is incredibly humbling. There's always something that goes wrong and um, you have to, you have to enjoy the grind. So yeah, I'm, um, for, for someone that wants to juggle everything, I would say you, you can endure it all. Uh, it depends on your tolerance for, for pain and, uh, and sleep as well, but see it, just look, look around at the abundance that you have or that you will have that you're creating and be grateful for that. Pressure is privilege and it's, it's all a mindset. Um, so yeah, I know that was kind of, um, high level, happy to dive into any, any, any specific thoughts, um, or, or more specific circumstances, if it's helpful. Uh, well, that's of course, a long, um, separate topic itself, but, um, uh, I was uh, listening to you, uh, how you change your priorities after becoming a mother and, uh, from my own experience. And of course, uh, it's nothing uh, so unique. I know, uh, that, uh, our children are our, uh, mirrors and our best teachers. So, uh, if you perceive these responsibilities, uh, as a parent, also as uh, a way you personally to grow, uh, you may integrate, uh, parenthood and, uh, home responsibilities also, uh, in your personal growth program and, uh, uh, perceive it from that perspective. Uh, but, uh, of course, still the. Uh, partnership in the family and uh, sharing the responsibilities is of critical importance. That's uh, uh, something that we unfortunately see still uh, as a challenge in some of the female entrepreneurs, especially startups that uh, eventually um, is difficult to take all the traditional female um, responsibilities and throw at home and on top of this to grow company from scratch with all the, uh, challenges and hindrances on the way. So, um, yeah, that is, yeah, yeah that is such a great point, Sasha. Uh, I cannot, I cannot overestimate the importance of partnership, both at home and in, and at work. Um, if I'm able to just about juggle everything and like literally just about, uh, it's because I've embraced this approach that it takes a village. So I've, uh, really empowered my, my husband as much as possible. He works too, definitely not a stay at home dad, but, um, Baba y Diado, the grandparents got very involved with, uh, raising number one and they'll be flying back in from Bulgaria for the first few months of the little one as well. Uh, so embracing the Bulgarian approach for sure of uh, the extended family leaning in. Uh, I do have a nanny at home looking after the kid. I do have a, a team that, uh, has really risen to the challenge already last year with my first mat leave. We have this terrific um, head of business development. She's our first hire of the company ever. And um, we always used to take meetings together, even though she's amazing, she's ex Salesforce, but we just had it in our heads that we're just much stronger if we show up as two and um, only very kind of like unimportant meetings we would take separately or, or she would take separately. So I was really dreading the mat leave. I mean, how, how is this company going to survive without me? Even though I, and by the way, I took a six week, uh, mat maternity leave. So we're not even talking months, but even, even for six weeks, I was really paranoid. How is this company going to survive? And do you know what? It survived and it thrived. And we actually learned that when you, when you empower people, when you kind of let them sink or swim, you can, you can discover that. They can do a, a great job. And since, since I came back from Matley, we only take the most VIP of the VIP meetings together. We work completely in parallel. We've closed a ton more deals, um, independently and then like uh, checking in. So yeah, just like the whole situation can be, can be, um, oh, we order a lot more food. So yeah, more home, more home cooked meals probably went out of the window a little bit. Weekends, I still try to prepare the odd thing, but yeah, just embrace that, em empower everyone around you, and just just accept that good good is good enough. Sometimes it doesn't all have to be, um, yeah, the perfect standard that we have the in perfect. our heads. Everyone will still be fine. 
Actually, this in a way relates to one of the questions that came from the audience from Irina Kotseva. Um, how did you uh, find out about this French company that uh, you referred to that has a big community of, uh, of uh, bank um, uh, CTOs, if I remember yeah, correctly? Yeah. How was your match made by yourself or by someone of the empowered uh, uh, colleagues of uh, yours? And uh, uh, how it happens, how you find your customers? Uh, and of course, please address the Irina's uh, uh, question specifically on the French uh, uh, French case. Yeah. Um, so basically, the, when you when you start a startup, the hardest thing is finding the first customer. I always find, and the first one will send you the second one, and the second one, the third one. So last summer, when we were relaunching and preparing to relaunch uh, Zorbit, we were part of a startup accelerator that connects you with potential buyers and potential companies that are interested in um, what these startups are building. So that's how we found our first our first. Two clients, two of the venture capital firms in Silicon Valley, and like leading leading names. So we started actually with with two at the same time, which was um, which was which was great. And then from then on, we've been growing very organically through basically community members, experiencing an amazing connection, and reading the reading the small print. Oh, powered by Orbit. So then they think actually I'm I'm a part of this community that should really know about Orbit. Um, so yeah, community managers, community managers referring others and community members having a great connection and thinking, I want this type of experience in the other communities that I'm a member of. So sending our website and in this particular case, the French company Spendesk, they were an inbound lead. So uh, they were an inbound lead on our website saying we heard about you and um, then uh, we typically always do a demo. We do a very, we're very customer obsessed and have a very um, uh, kind of wide glove service for our prospects and clients. We love being a thought partner. It's not a self-serve software product completely, especially at the beginning. We really invest in understanding community managers' goals, um, um, onboarding them on the product, monitoring very closely the data, making suggestions how to how to make improvements. So yeah, did a demo and we've been very closely working with the team to drive these results over time. So yeah, thankfully they, they found us, yeah. Actually, that's the destiny of 99% um, of the startups. Uh, you start building a SaaS platform, but uh, your customer support is still not developed. So you find a way to support your customers. Uh, but uh, that's part of the journey. And if you know uh, how you grow, that's perfectly okay. And people respect it and uh, like it. And nobody should be afraid or ashamed to share that uh, is in a stage where this is uh, half manually um, uh, done. And uh, But uh, let me ask you one thing, because you are based in uh, New York, what is the ratio between your American business today and your non-American or European business if uh, Europe is uh, predominantly uh, using your platform? Just to uh, get a perspective uh, also for our yeah. So yeah, we started. We we were we're a U.S. based uh, and incorporated company, and uh, given that we started in New York pre kind of pre pandemic, building relationships, uh, and I'm still here. It makes sense. We're still majority, more geographically represented client client wise in the U.S. So we have about seven seventy percent of our clients are U.S. organizations, and I would say roughly thirty percent in U.K. and Europe. Uh, looking to looking to increase that, we recently hired um, customer success uh, analyst in Bulgaria. Patty was on the call. Hi, amazing rock star. So with with extending the team in Bulgaria, that's our third hire. So we also have a, a junior machine learning engineer and a data engineer, and looking to grow the team in Bulgaria. My co-founder is also based in Amsterdam. We just made made the second hire in Amsterdam. So looking having a little bit. So half of the team is actually based in Europe, but only thirty percent of the clients. So. I see huge opportunities for for expansion, especially when you when you think about the diversity of um, kind of different types of European companies and environments and languages. Uh, I think it, seeing that seeing the community that, that French community of CFOs and all the best practices that are 
that are being exchanged across borders. I'm very, very excited to better connect European professionals. So, yeah, excited to double down on that and, and even out that that uh, breakdown of, of clients. I, I trust it and I know it also from my own experience working um, uh, on a global basis uh, uh, before doing what I'm doing at the moment that uh, really this uh, multicultural uh, presence is enriching a lot uh, every uh, business experience and uh, especially if you are in community business as yourself, uh, this is um, uh, really a big, big value add and uh, uh, happy to learn that uh, you also have your European sites, maybe Asian uh, at some point of time. By the way, uh, I want uh, to read the Juliana Desio's uh, comment. Uh, she says to us, uh, such a great and honest conversation. Uh, very much enjoy listening to you both. So, uh, oh, thank you, thank Juliana. You for we are happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we are happy that. So that's uh, our small community engagement uh, work that we are doing with Biliana today uh, for the she leaders uh, around Europe and around the world, of course. Uh, because we are going to the end, normally we try to stay within 45 minutes. We are close to one hour. Uh, one uh, traditional question that we have for the end, uh, how you hack yourself? how you uh, really uh, go out uh, and uh, balance uh, after pressure meeting or day. What is your recipe? Such a great question. Um, you know, the pandemic was very tough on me because I'm an extreme extrovert and I do get my energy from people. And there was a time when I started getting these headaches and at some point I told my husband, I just like so low on energy. and. That was even before the second pregnancy. So I, I went to my husband and I'm like, hey, I'm really worried. You know, what if I have cancer? I can over dramatize very quickly. And uh, thankfully, the same night we were going to a small open air birthday party, one of the very first gatherings post COVID. And I was like, I think I shouldn't go. I think I'm very, very sick. It was like, go out. Maybe you'll feel better. Halfway through the party, you know, I'm there like dancing, glass of wine in hand came to me, he was like, I'm still going to see the doctor. Do you have cancer? <laughs> I'm like, this is the best thing ever. I just love, you know, being surrounded by people again. So people are always my answer. I, I get energized um, by, you know, jumping in a crowd, seeing see my friends. Um, I never need time alone. Time alone actually depresses me. So again, for me, everything starts and ends with people. I also love stand-up comedy. Funny enough, last night I uh, I went to, I, I took six friends to a stand-up comedy night here in New York. The scene is incredible. And I find it such a, a guaranteed great night out. One of the cheapest, like, cultural activities that you can do and just breaking that spell with some genuine Betty laughs um, changes everything. We were all like, oh my God, we really, we really needed this. So stepping, doing, and being energized by people. Um, I, I love new experiences as well. As I, I, if, if I feel like I haven't left the neighborhood, if I feel like I've, I've gotten stuck in the routine, if I'm consuming the same type of, I don't know, TV or books, or the moment I feel stuck in the routine, I'm like, okay, where, where, what can I do? What's going on in town? Something, see something new, um, learn something new. And that I always find incredibly energizing. And then laughter is always the best medicine. So. Uh, here you show the Bulgarian connection uh, clearly because uh, <laughs> in Sofia and around us, uh, that's the way how we get energy uh, mm. uh, for our activities. And you have an open invitation uh, when you come next to to Sofia, we to organize and to uh, have a good big party together uh, and. Uh, Hopefully, hopefully this will uh, be soon. So, uh, Biliana, thank you very much. It was such a nice uh, conversation, although not being in one room uh, physically, uh, we've been in a room uh, virtually. Uh, part of the advantage of the uh, new technology empowered uh, life. 
and um, I wish you good luck with your uh, business uh, journey. I wish you also success and uh, uh, good luck with your uh, private journey uh, that you've uh, been uh, so open to mention to our audience that you are on the way uh, to become mother for a second time. So we keep fingers crossed and we will invite you to uh, share the experience afterwards to say how it is uh, to combine uh, uh, this with the uh, professional uh, growth of Orbit. So, uh, thank you so much, Sasha, and all the she leaders that joined in today. I love the conversation. Can't wait for the in person toast uh, in Sofia next, uh, probably next summer. Now, with when I come over with the two. The two kiddos to introduce them to um, uh, Tiala Taruda. And uh, <laughs> in touch in the meantime, if anyone's listening and thinks that I could be helpful in any way, please reach out on LinkedIn or check us out at Orbit with two eyes, uh, O R B I T dot A I, and say hello. Always, always happy to help and connect with another female leader and help any way I can. Best of luck to everyone. Uh, thank you, Biliana, and thank you, all uh, she leaders uh, that you are with us tonight. Uh, um, we are ending uh, uh, this very energizing, from my perspective, discussion and meeting with Biliana. And uh, I want to invite you to our next one, which will be on 9th of December. And it will be on the topic, uh, the value of using artificial intelligence for uh, they were uh, connection uh, and uh, specifically with a focus on uh, ethics uh, in uh, AI. So join us on uh, 9th of December uh, again. And uh, by that time, uh, I wish to all of you to be successful uh, professionally, to be uh, to be uh, happy privately and uh, just to be balanced people the way how you understand it. So goodbye for now and uh, see you in December. See you in December. That sounds fascinating. I'll definitely be joining in as a participant then. Bye, Sasha. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye.